Welcome to Theory Neutral, the podcast about stuff languages do. I'm Aiden. I'm Logan. And today we are continuing our discussion with Sai and Nai on feeling phonology, the conventionalization of phonology in protectile communities in the United States. So, this is a phonology paper. It's talking about, like, the actual phonological features of the tactile modality in this particular tactile community. So this is specifically about tactile ASL, and more specifically pro-tactile ASL. How phonology works in Swedish or Italian or Auslan is is going to be totally different. Um, well, m- but maybe not totally different. There, there are probably going to be some similarities. We've already seen some similarities uh, from the literature review. But just to be totally clear, this is not like trying to lay out an IPA for the protactile modality. It's just, this is what we have seen happening in protactile ASL. Yeah, because we're not even to the point of being able to do, like, that level of phonological analysis on, like, visual sign languages. Yeah. There's still a whole lot of open questions about visual sign language phonology. Yeah. Also, as I have understood, there is kind of a debate ongoing about whether protactile ASL is actually a different language from visual ASL or not. And just for clarity's sake, this particular paper is very heavily on the, yes, it is a new descendant language side. But, like, people disagree with that, so, you know, maybe don't take that as gospel. Uh, But that's the position that Edwards and Brentari are coming from. One interesting thing they say to sort of to that effect is they make an analogy with the genesis of visual sign languages, where oftentimes you get a whole bunch of people that have only really communicated kind of one way with not systematized home sign kinds of systems. And when you put them all in a community, suddenly you start having conventionalization fall out because they're reciprocating and deciding on things and that sort of a thing. And so they say this is kind of the same thing that's happening where you've got a bunch of people that were using ASL tactilely in not necessarily systematized ways with people that were mostly not reciprocating, all now coming together into a community where they are all sharing the same modality and starting to converge on linguistic norms in a very similar way. Mm Mm-hmm. Again, even more general background, because we haven't done a ton of sign language episodes yet, but sign language lexicons are conventionally, and this is not like language internal conventions like we're talking about with the the phonology, this is, you know, a convention among the sign language research community is that lexicons are divided into three major parts uh, called the core lexicon, the foreign lexicon, which is largely stuff that is borrowed through finger spelling, for example, and then the spatial lexicon. And the main focus here is on, uh, again, what uh, Brentari and Edwards call proprioceptive constructions, uh, which correspond to ASL classifier constructions and are part of the spatial lexicon. And the difference there being that the spatial lexicon is much more iconic and the core lexicon is much more arbitrary. So they're mainly talking here about phonological features of the highly iconic spatial lexicon. And then near the end, they go into a little bit of how these phonological features have bled into some of the core lexicon. And then I'll just quote, with this in mind, we do our best in this article to define protactile units on their own terms, not in terms of their relation to visual sign languages. And having done that, they then lay out this system of defining what the major articulators are. So for the rest of the paper, they identify A1, articulator 1, as the dominant hand of the sender or speaker. A2 is the dominant hand of the receiver. A3 is the non-dominant hand of the sender. And A4 is the non-dominant hand of the receiver. And so everything else in the paper is built around that established terminology. So we can talk about, you know, what A1 versus A2 is doing in the same way that in, like, oral phonology, we can talk about what your tongue versus your teeth are doing. And it's just a lot shorter than having to say dominant hand of the sender does this every time. They just say, you know, A1 is used for this, A3 is used for that. So then we go into table two which is the components of a proprioceptive construction. There's four of those components. There's the initiation, where there's a set of things that the sender can do to tell the receiver, hey, I'm about to manipulate your body, and check, is that okay? And that makes use of A1 and A3. 
which, if you will recall, are the dominant and non-dominant hand of the sender, which makes sense. Like, you're not going to expect the receiver to participate in asking the receiver whether they are okay with participating. But then we have the proprioceptive object, which uses A2 and A4. So after initiating and getting consent, then the sender will position the receiver's hands and arms So again, that's A2 is receiver's dominant hand, A4 is receiver's non-dominant hand. So again, that makes sense. There's a part of the sign that the sender does, there's a part of the sign that the receiver does, those use their respective articulators. Then there is the movement contact type. So that's the sender does something tactile to the proprioceptive object, which is composed of the receiver's arms. And then the prompt to continue, which is basically similar to initiate, it's telling the receiver, hey, please keep your arms in the spot that they currently are, because I'm going to keep doing more stuff to them. So immediately, what I can see from this is that there's a fairly intuitive split between the sender's arms do some stuff, the receiver's arms do some stuff, but there's no component of the complete co-constructed sign that requires a sender arm and a receiver arm mixed. Except for, for instance, the example Nye gave of if you're using the receiver's arm to be the tree in a squirrel ran up the tree, then the receiver's arm is being used as the place of articulation, as it were. Yes, yeah. Whereas if you were doing it in ASL for visual perception, then you would run the squirrel up your own arm. So you'd sign tree with your non-dominant hand and then use a bent V, a curled V shape probably for the squirrel to sort of scurry up it. And so in this, you're just using the receiver's arm to do that instead, because then they're not having to track two things. So this might be kind of an artificial distinction then, but they, according to this categorization, the receiver's arm would be part of the proprioceptive object, and then the squirrel would be classified as part of the movement contact, I assume. That's my understanding. Let me break this down to how this looks in practical use. Generally, the way that would be done is that the receiver's non-dominant hand is the one that would be used to set up the tree, and then the receiver would usually be using their dominant hand as hand over hand to feel the articulator's dominant hand scurrying up the tree. A lot of times, when you, even when you are setting up these classifiers, the receiver's dominant hand is still receiving the tactile hand over hand of what you're doing to that base classifier. Or another example, where you have to prompt them to give you a classifier is um, usually what you would do is the articulator would use their dominant hand to do sort of like a come here motion and then model the classifier that they want the person to use. And so in this case, let's say a a flat palm up hand shape. So then the receiver would put their non-dom hand in that palm up shape for the articulator to then use their dominant hand and then touch that palm to give information. And the receiver would be using their dominant hand to still follow the articulator's dominant hand. So an example would be that sign in in ASL. There's a sign where the palm becomes like a, a month calendar and the index finger is the first week of the month. The middle finger is the second week of the month, ring finger third week, and pinky is the fourth week. So if you want to say like the second week of June, you would run your finger along the middle finger. In visual ASL, you would just do that on your own hand and the person sees it. But in pro how often what you'll do is summon the person's non, the receiver's non-dom hand into that flat shape and then use your dom hand as the articulator and then you draw along the second week, the middle finger to show second week of June. Now, would you say that a reasonable approximation of what pro does is that where ASL would normally have something articulated with two hands and you have something going on in the speaker's non-dominant hand, protactile would use the base hand on the receiver instead, but otherwise the configuration, so like the phonological features that are permitted, the hand shapes, the orientations, etc., would be essentially identical. It's just that you're using the receiver's arm as or hand as the base rather than the speaker's arm but then 
adding on top of that a bit uh, extra, like you were saying earlier, uh, where you might use the receiver's arm passively, like possibly even on their upper arm, which isn't really a, an area that ASL normally uses, but sort of the, the kinds of classifier type constructions that they're talking about here, and also the kinds of signs you were talking about earlier, like um, paths would use very similar phonology to ASL's phonology for non-dominant hands. Yeah, so to answer the first part, there is a general pattern where you would use your own hand as the base in visual ASL, you would use the other person's hand as the base in protactile. That's true for a lot of time, but it also kind of depends how fleeting a sign is. Like, if I'm just mentioning the earth quickly in a sentence, I might not go through the trouble of getting the other person's hand to co-articulate the base and then sign the top of that sign. Whereas, if I'm interpreting a lecture about the earth, and that's like a recurring sign, that comes up and a theme that comes up, then I might go through that trouble of establishing that classifier and everything. And you're talking about the sign where non-dominant hand is fist facing down, dominant hand is a uh, thumb and middle finger pinching at the wrist. Exactly, an open eight hand. So some of that is sort of a in-the-moment calculation of like, is this a one-off sign that's still pretty understandable passively through the reception of the receiver's dominant hand, or is this something that's going to keep coming up. And, you know, some of it is also how new is this person to tactile. You know, if I'm signing with somebody who's new to tactile receptivity, I'll go more out of my way to use that two-way co-signing system, because closure skills or the ability to fill in the gaps is such a big part of tactile signing. A lot of people will, for the most part, only see with one hand and involve the second hand only as necessary. So if I were following you signing Earth, my dominant hand would be on yours, and so in that sign I would feel you doing an open H with a gap, and I might have a feeler finger extended ahead so that I actually notice the wrist contact. I may or may not feel that, but I probably would feel the impact just slightly. Yeah. But I wouldn't necessarily have a hand on your non-dominant, so you might might not even use your non-dominant hand. Right. You probably would. It's easier. Right. So for somebody like you or someone else who's very sensitive to the subtleties, I wouldn't bother doing the protactile method because I would know that you would still catch a glimpse of my non-dom base hand through your fingertips of your dominant receiver, whereas somebody else, where it seems more likely they might miss that base, um, then I'd probably be more like, okay, let me set up their hand as the fist and then sign earth. So it just sort of depends too. Like, I pick up on a lot of subtleties, so I know that in like my experience, most of the time I have no problem understanding visual ASL variant signs, but other people might miss more and they need more of that involved protactile for that clarity. Or you might need to prompt them to go to hand for some period. Yeah, so there are certain situations where anybody has to be two-handed if you're signing in mid-air, like if you're signing two people meeting. Oh yeah, of course. If both hands are being touched, and that's the beauty of protactile, is if you can put that on someone's forearm or on their thigh, then you can show two contact points without having to involve their second hand, especially if it's like a quick reference and things are moving fast and you're not, and you don't have the time to like get their other hand. You can quickly show the two people meeting by drawing it on contact space, so on their Body. So that's a good segue to discussing another one of the phonological features that they identify here, which is the distinction between airspace and contact space. And they have a capitalized name for a principle, super important. In section 1.2, they have named a principle, airspace is dead space, which in putting together the script here, Sai had some comments on. <laughs> but, like, the basic idea is if you are signing in airspace in front of or around the sender's or speaker's body, it's a lot harder to perceive that than when you have the tactile sensation of a sign made in contact with the receiver's body. And so there's... And that's definitely true. A lot of the accommodations that they talk about for changing modalities involve this distinction between airspace and dead space. And for what it's worth, I, I don't disagree with that part. I do disagree with the implicit thing that sort of implied by how they frame it, that you can't tell the difference between when the other person's hand is near their mouth versus near their eyes. You can. It's just harder. And that actually is requiring proprioception because you're telling... Well, how 
high is the hand? How tense is it? What is the angle of the arm? Just because I know, you know, human biomechanics. And yeah, you can tell, but it's not going to be as distinct as, well, it's on different parts of my body. For me, I'm someone who has like medically induced neurological hypersensitivity. Yay! I've had testing done that shows that I'm like off the charts in sensitivity on a physiological level, even compared to other blind people and deafblind people. So for me, whether somebody's hand is by their eye or their nose is like pretty easy and obvious, but I have to remind myself that it's not as obviously distinct for everybody, especially people whose deafblindness has a neurological component. You know, there are people who have some neuropathy in their fingers or who have a brain injury that also affected some of their tactile and so on and so forth. So that's where there is also truth to the airspace being dead space, you know. So the truth of that statement really depends on where you fall on the spectrum of neurological sensitivity and proprioceptive sensitivity. Also, you don't necessarily want to have the, like, antenna fingers out if someone is near their face because you don't want to poke them in the eye or up their nose or something. Right. And it can be, like, you know, if someone has a big beard or something. <laughs> it can be kind of, like, unpleasant to, like, suddenly be scratched. Where on the beard am I? <laughs> <laughs> so, there are moments where I'm just like, you know what, I'm really glad that you're making this a tactile classifier away from your face right now. <laughs> But it can go too far in the other direction, like, some people have this habit when they tactile where they think they have to drop all facial contact points and put everything in midair. So the sign not, like, negation, where the tip of your thumb touches your chin. Inexperienced tactile signers will do that in middle space, and then it's just a little bit like, wait, what are you saying? That would be actually kind of confusing to me. Yeah, it confuses me when they drop that contact point. In your experience, are there people who do this not by hesitation or dis- fluency, but actually by preference, like as the receiver, they would prefer to have it that way? I'd say the one context where that happens intentionally by experienced users is at the request of the tactile receiver. Like, I have actually asked people to do that on purpose on high pain level days. Oh, because you just don't want contact? Yeah. Or, no, we're like bringing my hand up high enough to touch the face. Oh, yes. It's so excruciating that I actually want them to drop the sign down. Yes. So that's like the one context text where I, that kind of thing is done on purpose by experienced tactile signers, but that's not something that's usually done. It would probably be helpful if I translate slightly. So there are several signs that are done at, say, the side of the face, like the sign for deaf goes from the side of the chin to just below the ear in the D hand shape. And I was saying, well, you could sign that in neutral space, which means in front of you, just below shoulder level. And the reason that that would be potentially easier is because if you are uh, following that with your hand, if you were following that in the regular way, then it would be a little bit farther from you because neutral space is closer to you versus uh, someone's ear is farther, so you have to extend more. And also, it's you know about six inches higher, and that puts a little bit more strain on your elbow and your shoulder. And so, if it's in neutral space, it's closer in, and so the receiver doesn't have to spend as much physiological energy tracking it. Same as how we were saying earlier about one hand versus two hand tracking. Um, The more you have to be farther out of your own neutral space, the more effort that takes. Right. So there's been times where like I injured my wrist or something so I asked my interpreters to tactile whisper (laughs) and drop contact points and then sign it down near my knee or something. But in general, those contact points are part of the rich information of tactile and one of the protactile methods that is sometimes used is the articulator will touch the receiver's face. This is mostly done for like very important signs to get right that don't have much context. Like if you're introducing a person's sign name, um, if a receiver isn't sure if that sign name touches the cheek or the forehead, then the articulator will sometimes reach and touch the receiver's own cheek or forehead to be clear about like, okay, my sign name is located right here on the face. Which is really common as a name, that is. Right, so sometimes the articulator will touch the receiver's chin, you know, cheek or forehead or nose to clearly show the contact point of a sign name or sometimes introduce a new sign where you can't use context to know what the location was even if you missed it proprioceptively. It was also just having in the back of my mind the trope of blind people touching other people's faces, which is uh, super cringe. Out of that context, no thank you. <laughs>
Moving on a bit, I, I've mentioned a couple of times that they do talk a little bit about the bleeding of tactile specific phonological concepts into the core lexicon. And part of that is a very interesting bit of statistics. This was completely counter to my expectation. But if we look at figure seven, they looked at a total of 1,450 spatial forms. So proprioceptive constructions, classifier constructions. And of those, 96% were produced in contact space. So they involved some part of the sender's articulation that was in contact with the receiver's body, which like kind of makes sense given the classification of the components of a proprioceptive construction, uh, you know, where one of them is movement contact. But also, I was kind of thinking, you know, spatial constructions are exactly the kind of thing that I would expect to happen, like, out in space. In contrast, out of 1,419 core lexicon forms, only 62% were produced in contact space. So the non-spatial lexicon is being produced more frequently in airspace than the spatial lexicon is, uh, which is just totally not what I expected. And I have to wonder, like, is that a stable thing? Is there a reason for that? Or is it just protactile ASL has not fully moved away from regular ASL yet? I think a lot of that boils down to the fact that a lot of the core lexicon that's not spatial is already pretty clear in tactile. So there's no motivation to modify it. You know, a lot of times from visual ASL, do are just perfectly clear in fact that ASL without having to modify them. They're especially the core lexicon one, you know, if I find a thumbs up. And there is no base hand. Yeah, no base hand. There's no incentive to put it somewhere on the body because it's pretty clear what's being signed already. It's like, okay, I can feel your thumb and I feel your other fingers and cool. I think the reason why a lot of the spatial signs are the ones that get modified is because that's the part of signing that is less clear for a lot of receivers tactually, especially keeping in mind that the majority of protactile users started out as deaf sighted, so they first internalized a sense of space visually, and then they transitioned to tactile. Like, I think one of the reasons why visual ASL, even without adding all that contact space, isn't that hard for me to follow is because I grew up leaning on kinesthetic and proprioception as my sense of space. I never had enough vision to understand space visually, so my understanding of space has always been non-visual anyway. So I also think a lot of that trend is tied to the fact that most of the people in this community are people who grew up deaf-sighted and later became blind, and what that looks like neurologically. So that group of people tends to need more reinforcement of spatial information into a more clear and salient tactile means because of what they've grown up with and what the transition is for them. Yeah, that makes sense. It's also worth noting that the foreign lexicon apparently does not show any adaptation yet. And that, to me, did make sense, like, just from an information theoretic perspective, because fingerspelling is super redundant in terms of all of the different components of visual ASL phonology. Like, most of it you can lose and be fine. So transitioning into tactile is like, yeah, it makes sense. You wouldn't have to do any adaptation to fingerspelling because you can just feel it. So yeah, if it turns out that most of the core lexicon is similar, then that makes the results less surprising. One would want to see data separated for, does this have a base hand? And is that what's being done with the contact space? Mm, Yeah. I don't know the stats or anything on this, but experientially, it seems like there's actually a little bit more from the spelling in tactile ASL hmm. to supplement than what I've experienced through visual ASL users. 
especially if you're signing one-handed or you're receiving one-handed, a lot of people will supplement a sign with finger spelling to disambiguate. How would you distinguish something like the minimal pair not yet and late, which is for non-ASL users that is signed by dominant hand flat facing downwards at your side, making a couple flaps. And the difference between the two is whether your tongue is sticking out slightly or not. That, that is not something I would want to feel <laughs> on somebody's face. <laughs> no, no. I have a story about that for someday, but a lot of times with the sign like late versus yet, I notice tactile signers tend to gravitate towards the sign for late. That's the L hand shape that drops on the passive. Oh, yeah. Open palm hand, so they'll just pick a different lexing that's more discernible, so they would just avoid the ambiguity. Another example is signs for butt and different are very similar. They are subtly different. Both signs use an extended index finger that starts crossed and then both arch away from each other, but the word butt tends to be a sign smaller. And it's got a little bit more of a twist as well. Yeah, there's more of a twist and it's, there's more of a push in the movement with different, but especially if you're tactiling with a newer signer, I'll find myself adding finger spelled B-U-T to clarify I'm saying but, but not different. So there's just moments where sometimes finger spelling gets added to eliminate possible ambiguity. Another one being like yes and possible. The difference between yes and possible is the more obvious difference is possible. You use two fists that nod and yes you use one fist. Possible the bounces are a bit slower um, but if somebody's receiving one-handed they're not going to see the difference between a one-handed yes and a two-handed possible and then depending on their experience with tactile they may or may not pick up on the subtle difference in how quickly you nod. Right so a lot of times like yes might Somebody might put that on a contact space, because that's kind of common too. People will sometimes sign yes on the forearm or the thigh, or in passing, they might sign on the shoulder. With the wrist in contact, or? With the knuckles in contact. The knuckles. And you kind of feel the nod. Mm. But I don't really see that as much with a sign like possible, so you might do something like that, or sometimes people will add Y-E-S, or so it just depends. I mean, I would also say, from my perspective, if so, as someone who only learned ASL tactually, I find... Visual ASL variants have sounded pretty mutually intelligible, but I have had experiences of sighted visual ASL users being confused by, by my blind dialect <laughs> ASL, so I guess that's where that controversy comes in. How much are these separate languages? How much are these dialects? All that. Does it have an army? Right. Army, navy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and that's a difficult question in any modality. Nobody knows what a dialect is, or what's a different language. So when Seattle raises its own army, then Protactile ASL will be a distinct language. Actually, a few things I found remarkable about this paper, mainly that it seemed to make quite a big deal out of something that to me seems very obvious. On the point of phonology, so the paper takes a lot of effort to say, oh, like, uh, you're using the receiver's hand or arm as a space on which to sign, and this is, like, shocking. But it doesn't mention that I can recall, or maybe only in passing, the things that I was saying earlier of using the receiver's thigh as an articulatory point, or their upper arm, which almost never happens in ASL, except for, like, sign for muscle. I can't really think of any others. And the points of articulation that are distinguishable and common on the thigh are not discussed at all in this paper, whereas to me that seems to be an actual question of what is the phonology of that space. Well, one thing I would say is when people are using the thigh, most of their focus is on the half of the thigh closest to the knee. Right. A lot of times I notice people will drop signs on the thigh in a very back channel kind of way. Like I've had people that sign for right as in like your right, correct? Mm -hmm. Drop. I've had experience in dropping that sign on my knee, and it's been so familiar with like the pressure of that drop and the rhythm of it that I can usually gather that that's what they're signing. Especially if it's like an enthusiastic thing, like right, 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 exactly, <laughs> right, exactly. You know, and there's not time to be like, hold on, let's switch hands and let me sign this for one second, and then you can keep going on with your exciting point. <laughs> or don't just like drop a right on the knee, and it's like. That's part of the aliveness of the movement, and part of what makes it feel so natural and there's a flow when you're in the pocket, you know. That's a beautiful part of pro-tactile is it takes away that very TTY feeling of like, I send a message, I wait to receive a message, I send a message, I wait to receive a message. 
and now there's more of this life simultaneous, we're both engaged. There can be natural overlap, which happens in all modalities, kind of thing that can happen. I suspect listeners may not all get the reference. Oh, TTY. So imagine instant messaging, but where everything you type is transmitted immediately. So you have to have a radio type go ahead handoffs so that you're not typing at the same time because then it gets confusing. So that is a thing that still exists actually to some extent, but not quite as much because people would just use text messages. But for instance, it comes up with text relay, which is actually a service I use, which operates sort of in the same mode. The reference point there being like, there's no space for simultaneous communication. Right. It has to be this like strict turn taking. So a lot of times tactile without pro-tactile kind of had that pressure because it was like one person is receiving at a time. Yeah. And you don't want to wait for the yes. Right. And a lot of that is also in the back channel. So where your perceiving hand is just following along, you're going to be signing that with your fingers that are tracking the sign, the hand that is moving, or with your other hand sort of resting on their thigh or something. And also, if you want to be fancy, you could do both people have a dominant hand signing and both people have one hand tracking, but I suspect that gets a little bit more tiresome. Yeah, that is something, especially in like very engaged conversations, both will have one hand on the other hand, and both will have like the dom-dom hand on the knee or something. So I distinctly remember the very first time I took a pro-tactile workshop with AJ Granda, who's one of the deafblind people who really put pro-tactile on the radar, and it brought ASL to life for me in a way that I had never experienced before. Because when I first learned ASL, it was from someone who was completely deafblind, but he only used tactile hand over hand. He didn't use all those other contact points. So it did bring a new life to the language for me, and it, I felt much more connected than I ever had before when I was introduced to that pro-tactile element. I think that's a big part of why it really blossomed so quickly. It has been spreading like wildfire over the past decade. Well, that sounds like an excellent point to wrap up on. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've gotten through everything. Um, mm-hmm. So I'll just say thank you very much, Sai and Nai, for contributing your expertise and commentary. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks. Thank you for doing this podcast. Theory Neutral is made possible by our listeners, families, and friends. Follow us on Twitter at Theory underscore Neutral, on Blue Sky at Theory Neutral, or send us an email at theory.neutral.podcast at gmail.com. Join us next time when we will be discussing stress deafness. Stress deafness.